Hello and thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul and this video is about Silhouette, a poem by Langston Hughes, and the title of it is Poetry as Symbolic Action. So the idea that we'll be exploring here is how to read a poem through the lens, through the idea of the language as a form of Silhouette by Langston Hughes Southern gentle lady, do not swoon. They've just hung a black man in the dark of the moon. They've hung a black man to the roadside tree in the dark of the moon for the world to see how Dixie protects its white womanhood. Southern gentle lady, be good, be good. So if you recall, I've been encouraging you to think about a poem as a little scene, a dramatic scene, a situation where one person is speaking to another or multiple people are speaking to each other. Um, we could also think about this as in, in communication, we might call this the rhetorical situation. That is, who's speaking, what are they trying to do, etc. So the first question we want to ask is, who is speaking? Who's the character, the person speaking these lines? Um, in some poetry, like Ezra Pound's A River Merchant's Wife, A Letter, it's very clear who's speaking because it tells us A River Merchant's Wife. Um, but in much poetry, it's not entirely clear. We have to kind of figure out from the words themselves who the speaker is. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean what their job is, what their name is, but what kind of person are they? What do they value? What do they want? How do they speak? How do they sound? Now, a lot of modern poetry, 20th century poetry, the authors uh, tend to write in their own voice. Uh, that is in a persona that roughly is analogous to their, their own per self, their idea of themselves. Uh, but this isn't to say that the author and the speaker are the same thing. If you get up and on stage and are giving a presentation, it's you, but it's also a particular version of you. You put on a mask, you put on a persona, you act as someone else, you only show part of yourself in that presentation. So in this poem, I would identify, since we don't have a clear name, I would say, well, this is Langston. That is the persona that Langston Hughes is creating for himself to enter this imagined situation. Here, after the speaker, we'll turn to the person spoken to, the audience or addressee. Uh, sometimes it's not clear in a poem who's being spoken to. Think about This Is Just to Say by William Carlos Williams. In that poem, we don't exactly know who this other person is. Is it the speaker's roommate, sibling, parent, friend, lover? We don't know. We have to figure that out or imagine possible scenarios to bring that dramatic situation alive. But here, in this poem, even though the speaker is not identified explicitly, we get a clear identification of the audience with the phrase Southern gentle lady. Now, just to stop for a second and think about, okay, so who is Langston? Who is the speaker, Langston Hughes? Who is this Southern gentle lady? Um, again, I want us to think about the speaker as not the real poet, not the real author, the human being that physically wrote or typed the poem, but a version of them, an image of them their persona, putting their, themselves on stage. Similarly, in this situation, the, the audience, the Southern gentle lady, is there some real person that Langston Hughes is trying to communicate with? I would say that's rather unlikely. Instead, the Southern gentle lady is standing in for a type of person that Langston, this poetic voice, this observer, is speaking to. So he creates this persona in order to enter the situation, which as we'll talk about on the next slide is a situation of a lynching, to communicate with this other person, this image, this idea of the Southern gentle lady.
So we've looked at the speaker, the person being spoken to, and now let's look at the text. What's being said, the, the message communicated from one to another. So here, the literal story of the poem, it's the story of a lynching. Or rather, the poem is one person telling another person about a lynching. That is, we don't see the lynching itself in the poem, but we hear about it as having happened from someone who has observed it or heard about it. So it's the story of a lynching, or maybe even the story of the story of a lynching. So that's the material. That is what the situation that brings together the speaker and the addressee. Their relationship to each other is defined by their relationship to this text, to this story. Their relationship to each other is defined by their reactions to or their participation in this story of the lynching. So that's the text, that's the, the raw material, we might say, the data, that the information that we as readers use to make the situation come alive, make the poem, the dramatic scene come alive. Now let's look at the interaction uh, between the speaker and audience, the um, address circuit, as I've called it in another video. That is how they relate to each other, what their values are, what their attitudes are, um, what they care about, and how that is communicated from one to the other and back. So what do we know about the speaker? What are his values? What does he care about? Well, given the story and given our what knowledge we might have of Langston Hughes, which he was an African-American poet, although that's not necessary to, to know in order to, to get something important or to understand this poem. Um, but we can get the sense just from the poem itself that this speaker is concerned with this murder, with this lynching, that it's something that bothers him, um, that he is concerned about violence, we also perhaps get the sense that he cares about this Southern gentle lady that he speaks to because he um, addresses her with respect, as we'll talk about in a future slide down the way. Um, so he seems to care about her and her reaction and her understanding of this situation. Now, what's his tone of voice? What are his emotions? What attitudes does he express? And really tone is something that we always come back to. We continually come back to and revise. Uh, but what can we say about his emotions or attitudes? He clearly isn't approving of this lynching. One thing that signals that is he says they have committed a lynching as opposed to we have committed a lynching or they have killed we rather than we have killed. So, and he also desires, he says, be good, be good twice. So he seems to want something from the Southern gentle lady. So we start to get a sense of what is important to him and what he's uh, feeling, what he's trying to communicate to his addressee. Now, who is the addressee? What do we know about her? Well, again, the, the speaker helpfully gives us this title, this name, Southern Gentle Lady. Let's look at those terms um, because they are very, each one of them is important for our understanding of this character and the speaker's attitude and relationship to her. Southern, what does Southern tell us? Well, it tells us where she's from geographically, but Southern, of course, especially when we think about it in the context of race relations and lynching, being from the South, the, the American South, the US South, uh, is related to the history of racial violence, racial oppression, um, slavery, lynching. The South is the sort of uh, ground zero, the the prime center of all those problems. So she's identified with the South in a certain way. We might also uh, recall that so being from the South is often a point of pride uh, for, uh, for people from the South in a way that people from the Midwest don't say I'm a Midwesterner or people from the Northeast don't say I'm a Northeasterner. They might say I'm a New Yorker, I'm a, I'm a Connecticut, whatever. But people from the South They'll say they're from the South and someone from Texas and someone from Alabama and someone from Georgia all have that Southern pride in common. So that he's calling her a Southern gentle lady, that might also indicate something of her own attitude, that she's very proud of her Southern heritage. Now she's gentle, 
Normally, with the word gentle, we think that we think of the idea of softness, kindness, uh, uh, affection, love, right? But and so there's that. She could be gentle. She could be nice, kindly. He he, he wants her to be good, so he wants something from her. He, he expects her to be good. But gentle also means high class, as in a gentleman. A gentleman is a man of a higher status. It's a term of uh, uh, respect for someone who is of the upper class, thus has certain values, certain behaviors expected of them. They have a certain sense of decorum and propriety. They also have wealth. And if we think about a Southern gentleman or a Southern gentlewoman, someone who has wealth in the South, where did that wealth come from? Especially if we're thinking about the period immediately following slavery. Well, most of the wealth in the South was in the hands of the descendants of slave owners. So that potentially ties this lady to slavery, to the history of racial oppression in the South. Finally, the word lady. Well, lady is not, tells us her gender, tells us her sex, that she's female. But lady is different from woman or girl. Lady is, again, a term of respect, a term of class status. A lady is a higher uh, class person than a woman or a broad, to use a, a more crude slang. So lady reinforces the sense that this is a woman in the upper crusts of society. So she's a kind, perhaps, or a woman expected to be kind, from in the high class of the post-Civil War South. Given that the speaker addresses her as Southern gentle lady, what does that suggest about his attitude towards her? Well, he's not using her name. Instead, he's using this rather elaborate title that accentuates, emphasizes her both her Southern status as well as her uh, class status. And, of course, implied is her racial status. A southern gentle lady is likely to be white, is likely to be Caucasian. So the speaker has certainly an attitude of deference or respect towards this woman. He's not presuming to call her by her name. He's not assuming any sort of intimacy. Instead, he's calling attention to the fact that she is of high status, which suggests perhaps that he correspondingly is of low status. And... If he, if the speaker, if we are, are identifying it with Langston Hughes, the author, or at least as a persona of Langston Hughes, part of that deference is not just because of the lady's class, but because of her race. Langston Hughes is African American. The Southern gentle lady is white. He is telling her about another African American man being murdered. So of course he is going to speak with a certain respect, with a certain uh, almost even perhaps sense of intimidation or fear or wariness because he does not want the same thing to happen to him. Finally, let's think about the speaker's implied intentions. So what is he doing? Again, he's telling this lady about a lynching. Why? Why would he want to tell her that? Does he just want to inform her? Is he just giving her a message, giving her the news? Or does he want to have some effect on her, shock her in some way, perhaps, or make her feel guilty, make her feel fear, make her feel anger? Perhaps he wants something from her. He tells her to be good twice. Maybe he wants her to take some sort of action. So we start to get a sense of what the speaker's implied intentions might be, what he wants, that, that he needs something from this woman, some sort of reaction or action for her to take because of or in response to this horrible murder that he's telling her about. Okay, now let's get to the heart of the matter, which is the language as symbolic action. Remember, I talked about language not as something that just informs or labels, but language is an activity. You make promises, we threaten, we entice, we seduce, we flirt, we suggest, we manipulate all these things through language. So if this is a scene between two people, one person telling something to another, 
we don't just want to know what the literal words are or what the content of that message is, but what that person is doing, how they're interacting, how that this conversation affects these people. So let's move slowly through the poem and see how, look at each uh, sentence or statement or, or expression and try to identify the actions that are going on. So Southern gentle lady, do not swoon. First, just in a very simple sense, well, he's addressing the lady. He's t saying her name or her uh, title. So he's speaking to the lady. That's, a, that's an action, addressing her. And he gives her a very simple command, do not swoon. He tells her not to do something. So we could call this, literally, this is a command in terms of grammatical structure, although this doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean it's an order. He's not like a drill sergeant telling a soldier to drop and give him 20, but he's telling her not to do something. So this is just the very simplest uh, sort of actions that are going on here. Now let's get a little bit more complicated. Now the speaker's telling the woman not to swoon. That is, don't faint. Swooning is, a, is fainting, losing your uh, uh, consciousness because of something so shocking. So he tells her, do not swoon, but why is he telling her that? There has to be some reason. You don't just say that to someone randomly. It's in preparation for something that might make the woman swoon, something that might make her um, upset. So when you tell someone, do not swoon, it's sort of like saying, you might want to sit down for this. I'm about to tell you something pretty heavy duty, and you might want to be prepared for what's about, what you're about to hear. So we can think then he's not just commanding her or telling her not to swoon. In doing that, he's preparing her for upsetting news, preparing her to be able to handle the upsetting news. Or we might also think about it as a warning, saying, I'm about to tell you something upsetting. So he's preparing her and warning her at the same time. Warning, you're about to hear something upsetting. And that also indicates that he expects that she will be upset. I expect you to be bothered by what I'm going to tell you. You don't say, do not swoon. You might want to sit down for this about information that you would think the person's not going to care about. So he expects her to be upset, and he's, in a certain sense, signaling to her, signaling to her that he, that he expects her to be upset. And finally, we might say that the speaker intends to upset the lady with his news. He is perhaps even starting to try to get her upset just by telling her, hey, I'm about to tell you something really bad. Just telling someone you're about to hear something really bad, it evokes anxiety and fear just even before they hear what's bad. So perhaps the speaker intends to upset the lady with his news. He wants her to be bothered by this. Why? Well, that's in service of some larger action that the poem as a whole is undertaking. They've just hung a black man in the dark of the moon. So what is the speaker doing here? Well, again, in the very simplest terms, he's informing the lady of what's happening. He's telling her this is what has happened and what has just happened. So giving information, telling her the news. But he's not just telling her an event. He's also giving some details about the event. He identifies who did it, the perpetrators, they. We'll talk in a moment about who they are, but he says they've done this action. So he tells us that something's happened and he identifies a group in vague, in vague terms, but still identifies that there's a group responsible for this, saying they also implies that it's someone known to them, saying they've done it, they being, you're referring to a specific group of people that's known to you. And he's also describing the event, giving some details, telling us where it happened or when it happened in the dark of the moon. 
So these are the, the more literal actions that the speaker is undertaking, the more simple, uh, basic, foundational actions that he's taking. But again, there's more sophisticated or more significant actions going on simultaneously. When he says, they've just hung a black man, he's implicitly differentiating or dividing himself and the lady, I, the person who's saying this, and the implied you, Southern gentle lady, differentiating between them and the people who've done the crime. They've hung a black man. He doesn't say you've hung a black man or you and your friends or your friends or your family have done this. He doesn't say we have done this, so he's not part of the group. So he's differentiating between them. And that's not just a case of you know, giving one group a name and another group a different name. It's not just saying, well, they're them and, and we're this group. It's saying they're murderers. These people are horrific criminals. They've committed this awful crime. We are not part of that horrible group. Or at least he's suggesting that they're not. Hoping maybe that the lady is not part of that group. So he's also proclaiming in a sense their innocence. And again, I think just by the fact that he's telling her this, and he says it so simply, they've just hung a black man in the dark of the moon. He doesn't give a lot of detail, he doesn't tell us who it was, he doesn't tell us why yet. So it seems that he expects just this news alone will upset the woman. Just hearing that a black man was murdered will be enough to upset her. So in that expectation, we might ask, is he also putting a certain burden, a certain responsibility on the woman to react in a certain way, a kind of moral burden to be upset? They've hung a black man to the roadside tree in the dark of the moon. So the speaker begins in the next stanza to repeat his description. He starts saying it again, which raises the question, why does he repeat it? Why does he need to say it again or feel the need to say it again? Why do we repeat ourselves when we tell someone something and then say it again? What in their reaction or lack of reaction might have prompted us, might prompt us or might have prompted him to say this again. However, we also notice he's not just repeating the same words, he's elaborating on it. He gives us more details. He tells us it was to the roadside tree, a specific tree perhaps that we know. You know the roadside tree, the one that we all drive by and walk by. So he starts to elaborate on his description again. We ask ourselves, why does he feel the need to give more details? What effect is he trying to have on the woman? Is he trying to make it more real, make it more vivid? Is he trying to make sure that she's heard him? So the repetition is also a reinforcement. I'm reinforcing to you how horrible this thing is by saying it again they've committed this murder, they've hung this man, they've killed him. You have to hear it again. So in reinforcing the horror, he's also forcing the lady to hear what he has said. He's making sure she's heard him. I told you, but now I'm going to tell you again, because you need to understand what has happened. So he wants her to hear this. He wants to make sure she knows what's happened and to know it in vivid detail. And so why might he be telling her that? Why might he be giving her more details? It's not to amuse her. It's not to entertain her. Why tell someone the gruesome details of a horrific murder? Because you want to upset them in some way, probably. You want them to react. You want them to feel the horror of the crime. So the speaker is perhaps intentionally disturbing the later lady, intentionally trying to upset her by telling her in more detail again about this horrible murder. They've just hung a man from the roadside tree in the dark of the moon 
for the world to see how Dixie protects its white womanhood. So as he continues on, the second part of the sentence gives us the reasons why, the reasons why these people did the lynching. They did it so they would protect white womanhood, or rather to show the world how they protect white womanhood. Now, how does the speaker know this? How does he know that this is the reason? Was he told this, or did he interpret it himself? Is this the message that he got from the lynching? Or is he imputing this message? That is, this is what he thinks they, they mean. Good question. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but also, in addition to explaining that this is why they've done it, he connects, connects the lady to the lynching itself. Because who, Dixie is, of course, the South, the name for the South, the Old South, who is a member of the white womanhood of Dixie, the Southern gentle lady. She is the epitome in some way, the representative, the example itself of white womanhood. So what does that mean if she is in some way a part of this white womanhood? What is the speaker saying about her relationship? He's connecting her to the lynching, but how? By saying, they've done this for you. They did this because they wanted to show the world that they were protecting its, their white womanhood, and that's you, Southern gentle lady. One interpretation is that we think the speaker's blaming the lady for it. They did this on your behalf, so in a sense, you're responsible, you're the cause. And if he's saying this is partially your fault, I doubt it, it's not likely that someone's going to say that um, in a neutral tone of voice. This is an accusation. This is a judgment. This is perhaps even a condemnation of the lady for being involved in the lynching, even if only as the um, stated reason for it. Even if she knew nothing about it, he's judging her as in some way responsible for the death of this man who's been murdered. And if you tell someone, hey, this is your fault, or even hint, suggest to someone that they are at fault for something like this, a horrible murder, you're not just doing it, again, to give them information. You want them to feel bad. He may be shaming her, guilting her, making her feel guilty, trying to make her feel terrible and regret for her role, even if it was a completely passive role in the lynching. And if you tell someone, if you try to shame someone, if you try to make someone feel guilty, obviously you expect that they will feel guilty. There's no point in telling a serial killer that, that what they've done is horrible because the serial killer's not going to care. They're not going to feel shame. But if he's telling this woman, hey, you're partially at fault for this, he expects her to acknowledge that guilt and to take some responsibility. Southern gentle lady, be good, be good. So here the speaker is once more addressing the lady directly. He spoke to her directly at the beginning, Southern gentle lady, and now he's speaking, her, speaking to her directly again, Southern gentle lady. And it's another command in the sense of telling her to do something. It's in the imperative mode, although that doesn't, again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's an order like a drill sergeant giving an order to a, to a soldier. He's saying, be good, be good. He had originally told her, do not swoon, get ready, I'm about to tell you something awful. And now he's saying, be good. And of course, he says it twice, again, repetition, be good, be good. So there's this that sense of emphasis on the need for her to be good. So of course, this raises the question, what does it mean to be good? When the speaker says, be good, what does he want? What does he want her to do or be? What would it mean to do the right thing, so to speak, in this situation? Well, obviously, it, being good is somehow a response to the lynching. It has something to do with the lynching. So he wants her to be good in some way as a response to this. 
Some students like to find in this poem uh, suggestions of a romantic relationship between the murdered man and the southern gentle lady, or between the speaker and the southern gentle lady. Perhaps that's because of uh, works like To Kill a Mockingbird, um, or stories of interracial relationships that were uh, where one or both parties were a victim of racist violence. Um, and that's certainly possible. And so in that case, be good would mean perhaps protect your lover. You should have protected the, the man from this or protect me from a similar thing. Or it could mean be chaste, stay away from African-American men. When you have a relationship with one, you put him in danger. That's possible, but I don't think it's necessarily true. That is, if you are the kind of person who's going to lynch someone because of their race, do you need a reason for it? Does there have to be a reason that they're reacting to? No, of course not. This is, it's racist hatred. It's, it doesn't come out of rationality. So there doesn't need to have been a reason for the murder to have taken place. And in some sense, I think that makes it all the more powerful and horrific. This is just something that occurred. They were thinking they were protecting their white womanhood, but there probably was nothing even going on. The tragic murder of Emmett Till uh, is a perfect example of this, of an African-American boy who was killed just for looking at a white woman. So there doesn't need to be a reason for it to be, for, for them to have killed him. So what does it mean to be good then? Perhaps it means for her to do something about this violence, to speak up, to act in some way to prevent it. If you, if she is the reason why it's happening, that is if, if uh, it's being done on her behalf, then maybe there's this expectation that being good will somehow be a fight or resistance against that kind of violence.
to go back to the issue of, of the actions then, when the speaker says, be good, be good, he's not just telling her to be good. Perhaps he's begging her to be good. Please be good. Please do something. Make some action. It could be a, 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 an act of, um, you know, desperate, uh, a desperate request. But again, it also suggests that he expects that she will act, that she will listen, that she will hear him saying, be good, and that she will respond. He's not, he's, he's expecting that this will not fall on deaf ears. And finally, we might say he needs her to act, or he's telling her that he needs her to act. He needs her to do something. Why? Because she's the Southern gentle lady. She's the woman who her status is in some way um, the legacy of slavery and racism and the violent acts that are being done are being done on her behalf. So she is positioned better than anyone, perhaps, to do something about this kind of violence. Okay, let's review. First, I should say, this is, of course, not the only way to read this poem. There's much more to be expressed, much more to be given voice. And I don't think what I'm doing here is, even though I'm obviously saying a lot of things that are not in the poem and literally in the poem, uh, I'm not doing any kind of complicated or weird decoding or symbolic transformation, translation. I'm just trying to give voice to what's implicit, what is behind the words, what gives the poem its power, giving it, give expression to that unspoken, those unspoken ideas. So there's a lot more to be expressed. There's many different ways one could read the, the relation between speaker and addressee um, and the particular actions that he's undertaking. Um, but the important thing I think here is to focus on the relationships and the actions. Who are these people in this scene? And who are they to each other? What does the language do? That is, what actions is the speaker undertaking when he expresses him or herself to the other person? What does the speaker want? The language will always suggest in some manner their desires. So what does the speaker want? And finally, how do the speaker's actions work to fulfill that want? How does what he or she says and does through the language, how does that attempt to get for them their goal, the desired outcome from the other person, from the person they're speaking to? So these are just some of the, again, basic questions to understand, to flesh out, to uh, activate, make the poem come alive as a dramatic situation between one speaker and another addressee between two people communicating in a dynamic, real, powerful way. If you have questions, of course, feel free to contact me. Otherwise, I hope you have a great day and I will see you in the next video or the next time we see each other in class. Take care.